Hey everyone, I'm Jeremy Swift and I'll be walking through the book of Ephesians with you. Last time, if you recall, we went through chapter 3 where we talked about the mystery of the gospel and Paul had a prayer for the church for strength. This week, we're going over chapter 4, so let's get started. As with the other chapters in Ephesians, this chapter can be broken into two themes. The first being one body and the second being new life. In the first theme, I've broken it into two sections. In the first 10 verses, we have being one in Christ in one body, and the second being equipped in one body. In the second theme, new life, there are two sections as well. Abandon the old for the new in verses 17 through 24, and removing old behavior in verses 25 through 32. In the first part of the chapter, Paul writes about walking with the Spirit in unity. Verse 1 reads, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, there's a number of things that jump out to us in these verses. The first being that there's an expectation of how we walk through life. Paul uses the phrase, walk in a manner worthy of the calling. The calling that he's talking about is the calling to Christ, the calling to the church. And so there's an expectation that we walk a life that is reflective of Christ. And the attributes or the qualities that he lists after this are oddly familiar, or maybe not. He says we're supposed to walk with humility and gentleness, patience and love. These all look like the fruits of the Spirit that we see in Galatians and Corinthians. So, the Spirit is aiding us in our walk to reflect Christ. And verse 3 is particularly interesting. He, he writes, We should be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Maintaining the unity that he's talking about here is a unity with fellow Christians. It's, it's a unity that is already present, that the Spirit has already naturally given us as a Christian body and we should be eager to not disturb this or to destroy this unity that has already been put in place. And this natural unity is going to be one of peace between the members of the church. Now Paul starts talking about one body in the church. In verse 4 he writes, there is one body and one spirit just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. And this starts looking like a Christian theology lesson pretty quickly. Paul talks about one body, which is the church. He talks about one spirit, one Lord or Jesus, one Father, one faith in Jesus, he talks about one baptism or one moment when we became believers. These are all ones that he's talking about because he's trying to stave off any thoughts of there being segregation in the church. There is, at the time, there were Jews and Gentiles coming together to build the church. And there was a lot of uh, different beliefs. So. <laughs> We've had thousands of years to, to get past that, but we still have lots of different beliefs. Um, we can be thankful for our early church fathers for staving off a lot of those, uh, those different beliefs, but we still have them today just as surely as we had them back then. And what Paul is saying is there is only one of everything that he just talked about. Uh, if we look closely at what he talks about as a father, there's one God and Father of all, of all believers, who is over all, through all, and in all. So when we start thinking about believers in other denominations, we think differently than they might about theological issues. Our beliefs differ maybe in very small things, maybe in major things, but as long as there is the belief in these things, the major issues, the salvation issues, now we are all one in the church 
and we should treat each other accordingly, which is where verse 7 comes into play. It reads, But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gifts. Now, at first glance, this looks like it might be, you know, when he talks about grace, that it's a saving grace. And that's not really what he's talking about. He's talking about Christ's gifts. Gifts to individuals to further the church, to build up the church. And we'll see this in the following verses. But this is all about what's given to each one of us to enrich God's one body of believers. As an example, let's look at the grace that Paul was given and the gift that he was given. Let's rewind to chapter 3 again and look at verses 1 and 2, particularly verse 2. And I've underlined it here. Um, it reads, The stewardship of God's grace that was given to me, Paul, for you, the Gentiles. What Paul is pointing out is that grace was given to him by God that he's now a steward of to go and build up God's church. And now God granted was creating a pretty hefty portion of his church at this point. But nonetheless, Paul's ministry, Paul's purpose was to go build up the church. And when we look at Paul's past, he's the first one to admit that he was not worthy of this task by any means. And so God said, you know what, you're going to go do this anyways, and I'm going to give you the grace and this gift, and you are to go. And this is an example of what I'm talking about. Now let's take a look at those gifts. In verse 11, Paul writes, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ. Paul lists four or five, depending on who you talk to, um, gifts here that are meant for ministry. And their grand purpose is to build up the church, as we talked about. And the list is the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers. Now, also who you, depend, or who you talk to, um, you can debate whether or not all of these are active today. You can debate whether or not the shepherds and teachers are the same or different. Um, you can debate all those things, but ultimately these are ministry roles that were given to us as a church to build it up. And each one of us is given something to build the body. And it's up to us to act on it. Now, it's interesting that Paul doesn't tell us whether we have these all the time or for a short period of time, if we have the same one all the time, that it's permanently ingrained in us. When we look at Paul, who knows, maybe he always was an evangelist to go out and change people's minds. Maybe that was ingrained in him and God used that. Or maybe God changed him during the time when Paul was going out and figuring out the new mystery that had been revealed to him and now using the zeal that he had, naturally, he went out and became an evangelist. We don't know those things. But what we do know is that we all have a role to play in building up the body of Christ. And Paul tells us we are given these gifts by grace. Now for the reason of building up the body. In verse 13, Paul writes, Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God. He continues in verse 14, So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. The first few things that Paul lists here are to build up the body. We're supposed to have unity in the faith. Unity in the Christian theology lesson that we, that we read about a few verses earlier. Um, but also knowledge in Jesus, knowledge in the Son. So that 
we can grow as individuals, so that we can grow as a whole in these areas. But then he mentions almost a defense as well, things that can deter us from growth, a defense against that. He doesn't want us to get tossed to and fro by bad doctrine. Bad doctrine has been around since the absolute beginning of the church. Before the beginning of church, there was bad doctrine. <laughs> and there's still bad doctrine today. Um, everybody has a theology. Everybody has beliefs. They may not be correct beliefs, but everybody has them. And what we want to do as a church is we want to have the right beliefs. And Paul is saying that if you build up in these things, you will defend against being tossed to and fro by the waves or the wind of bad doctrine. And then you pile on human cunning and craftiness and deceitful schemes. Well, we've all seen those. Um, we, as a people, can easily pile these on. And we need to be able to defend against them as individuals and as a church. And if we have a strong foundation in those first few things that Paul talks about, our faith and our knowledge of Jesus, then the rest of this will be easier to defend against. And that's the reason for building up the body. Now we're in the back half of the chapter where Paul talks about new life. But first he says we must abandon the old. In verse 17 he writes, Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. Paul starts out by saying, Now this I say and testify in the Lord. Paul is testifying to the Lord, which means he's really serious here. And what he's saying is that we can't live the life that we used to live. No longer walk as the Gentiles do. And then he explains how they walk and, and what they're like. He says their minds are, are futile. They have no purpose, no meaning, no... Um, no understanding of anything godlike. They're, they're alienated from God because of their ignorance. And all of this stems from the hardness that is in their hearts. Um, he goes on to say that they're, they're callous and they've given themselves up to sensuality. We can look at the people of the past and understand what they did um, in their common everyday life, but there's nothing new underneath the sun. Our lives today, our world today, is just as sensual, and the practices that we have are just as impure as any society from our past. And what he's saying is that this is our old life, and we have to shed that. We can't go back and live the old if we're going to live the new. And now, let's talk about the new. In verse 20, Paul writes, But that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus, to put on your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God, in true righteousness and holiness. There's a number of things in these verses that kind of stand out. First of all, um, the first part where he says, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him, um, this is a result of the ministry gifts that we just got, talking, got done talking about. And he doesn't necessarily know who he's talking to, so he's assuming that they have been, uh, they have heard and they have believed and this is for them. Um, he says, put off the old self and put on the new self. But there's an interesting process that's showing here. And I believe it's an iterative, iterative process where you keep 
almost cycling through, not necessarily on purpose, but as a natural process. He says, put off your old self, renew your minds, and put on the new self. The renewing your mind has to come in between the putting off the old and putting on the new. And so there's this cycle that happens. You put off the old, renew your mind, put on the new. Now, our nature is to fall back to the old, which is why Paul is telling us to <laughs> get rid of the old, because we want to go back to the old. We have a tendency there. It's tempting and it's familiar. So when we fall back to the old, he says, put off the old, renew your mind, put on the new. And as a cycle, lather, rinse, repeat, keeps occurring, we keep going through it, and this is our sanctification process with the Holy Spirit. Now let's look deeper into what it means to renew the mind. Our first stop is in Romans 12, where Paul writes in verse 2, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So there's a battle that's happening here in the world and, and in the mind. Um, Paul says that we are to be transformed by the renewal of our minds. And by changing the way of our thinking, this leads to the transformation. And I mentioned this before that there's there's a difference about the thoughts, the transient thoughts in our heads and our true core beliefs. Um, our core beliefs reflect in our actions. Our thoughts are just that, they're thoughts. And what Paul is talking about here is when we renew our mind, when we change the way we think, now this leads to transformation. And if we look back at the verses that we just saw in Ephesians, this is part of that cycle of moving forward. Put off the old, renew your mind, put on the new. The second stop is in Romans 8. In verse 5, he writes, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, and to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. What Paul is, or who Paul is talking to here, is believers. He's not talking to unbelievers in these verses. So he's calling out the fact that we have a choice. We can either live with our minds in the flesh, our old life, or in the spirit, our new life. And he says, to set the mind on the flesh is death, and to set the mind on the spirit is life. Those are the only two choices. There doesn't seem to be a third. And more to the point, he says, the mind that sets itself on flesh is hostile to God. If we recall, prior to our conversion, prior to our belief, we were enemies of God. And our minds, thereby, were hostile to God. If we put our minds back into living our old life, our minds are going to remain hostile to God. And furthermore, he writes, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. If we're living in the flesh, in our old life, we can't please God. And that's why we need to go through this process of getting rid of the old, renewing our minds, and putting on the new. Now Paul begins to list behaviors that we need to remove from our lives. And if we look at these behaviors, these are behaviors that tend to 
destroy relationships or hamper that unity that we are supposed to maintain with the Spirit. 25, he writes, Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. So flat out, he says, stop lying. Only speak the truth of your neighbors. And it's okay to be angry. He says, be angry. We see that, that Jesus was angry many a time. <laughs> he, he was angry at the temple. He was angry at the Pharisees when they challenged him uh, or, or dared him to heal on the Sabbath. There's a number of times when Jesus was angry. So being angry is okay. But Paul says, do not sin while being angry. So if your anger is, is selfish, if it's a self-fulfilling um, anger that, that burns for you and not for any other purpose, this is not the anger that is a good anger. Um, he says, do not let the sun go down on your anger. That is to say, don't let it linger. Don't, don't let it go beyond the day. Resolve issues that you have with others in the church before the sun goes down. And if you don't, this gives opportunity to Satan to let this fester into something else. And when that happens, this starts to degrade that unity that we have with one another. Now we start to resent others. We start to uh, purposely think badly of others and it grows. We know how this works. We've all experienced it. I don't need to explain it. But this is what Paul is warning about. It's to maintain the unity of the church. Let's keep going with these verses. In verse 28 we read, Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such that is good for building up. Verse 30, we continue, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. This is an extensive list. You can see it all underlined on the screen there. Don't steal. One of the Ten Commandments. Don't do it. Instead, labor so that you can give things away, is what Paul says. No corrupting talk. Instead, use our mouths for building others up. And the list goes on. But there's something else that's important here that Paul points out. He says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. I'd like to touch on this before we end this. When we look at the Holy Spirit, John 14 says that the Holy Spirit is our helper. And he's been given to us as a helper. He's right alongside us. He lives inside of us. He seals us for redemption. Um, and when we grieve him, we make him sad or sorrowful because of what we've done, what we've said, our actions. God does not want sin. And when we follow down that path, the spirit is grieved. I don't know about you, but personally I have moments where time seems to freeze and something goes through my head and says, wait, do you really want to do that? Or wait, you probably shouldn't do that or whatever. And at some point there's a crossroads. You can either go along with what you were going to do or you can choose not to. And it's at this crossroads that I have a choice, a way out or not. And if I choose the not, it's at that point that I've felt disappointment for my actions, a conviction for my actions. I can assume that I've grieved the spirit. Now, I don't know what it's like for you, but that's what it's like for me. And let's look at what it means to grieve the Spirit a little bit more. 
An example of grieving the Spirit is found in Acts 5. We read, But a man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property, and with his wife's knowledge he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of this land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. Now, if you keep reading, the ramifications of this, uh, this lying to God are, are quite severe. And I'm not saying that this is the ramifications of grieving, grieving the Spirit. But what I am saying is that this is an example of grieving the Spirit. What has happened here is that Ananias has some property that he sold, and he's gone and he's told the apostles, this is everything that I got for the land. And he didn't mention that he kept some of it. He could have. He didn't. Um, he wasn't required to give everything, but he did it presumably for personal reasons that he looked pretty darn good. And this is the part where he has lied to God because the Holy Spirit was there. He saw everything happen. He had instant replay if he wanted it, but he didn't need it because he saw the whole thing. He knew Ananias' heart. He knew his wife's heart. He knew the actions that had happened. There was no hiding anything from the Holy Spirit. And there's no hiding anything from the Holy Spirit when we're involved either. He gets to see it all, and he's saddened by what he sees sometimes. And that's what Paul is saying that we shouldn't do. We shouldn't grieve him by our actions of sin. And that's what I have for you in Ephesians 4. Next time we'll go over chapter 5, where we'll get some more warnings from Paul, but also we'll get to see what it truly looks like to reflect Christ in our lives and in the roles that we hold in our lives. I hope this was helpful, and until next time, God bless.